I, I really, there's a good joke that kind of like sets us up for what we're going to be talking about today. And it's, it's a social media meme. You know, it's, social media's got a great way of taking, uh, you know, jokes and making them funny because you can put pictures to them. And, and so there's this like old joke that there's two kinds of people in the world, right? You know, and uh, one of them that we got online is this. Like there are two kinds of people in the world. One that will set one alarm. Uh, I think we got, there we go. One that will set one alarm and one that has to set 19,000 alarms in order to wake up. Yeah, you know, like, wh which one of these people are you, you know? It's, and it's like, why? Why would you have to? Anyways, I don't know. But there are two kinds of people in the world. One that sets one alarm, one that has to set 17,000 alarms. There's another one uh, that's becoming real popular on social media during this time of year. It's that there's two types of people in the world, those who think Die Hard is a Christmas movie and those who are wrong, you know? Like, I'm already starting to see that one. I'm, yeah, see, we got some clapping for it. That's a, that's a Christmas movie. That a, that's a Christmas movie. Uh, I've already seen this one pop up once this year. I'm pretty sure we have to wait till after Thanksgiving, people. I'm almost, I'm almost positive Jesus said that. Um, so, but there's two types of people in the world. So, here's the thing. What I want to talk about today is uh, I think there are many different two types of people in the world. One of those is there's two types of people in the world. I'm going to call them the in it to win it and then the take it to leave it. All right, so and here's how you, here's kind of the difference between the two. Uh, you might be a take it or leave it person when it comes to winning. Uh, if you have ever described yourself as like, hey, I'm not really competitive, uh, right? Maybe you'll avoid games because it draws a line between people that you're a little bit uncomfortable with or something like that, you know? Uh, if you've ever found yourself saying like, I'm just here to have fun, you might be a take it or leave it person where, you know, you think like winning is cool, but I'm going to kind of step into the game, let the chips fall where they may, and let's all just have a good time. Like, you might be a take it or leave it's person. Now, if you're an in it to win it's person, everything I just said makes you angry, right? <laughs> like, you just found yourself getting grumpier because of all those things that I, I, I just said. And so, uh, here's a good example of a t uh, uh, an in it to win it person. Uh, last week, or two weeks ago when I was here uh, preaching I, after service, I was talking to uh, Vern Blaze. And, and Vern, he coaches middle school cross country. And uh, he was telling me that we've had some beautiful weather recently. I mean, minus that storm. That storm was serious, wasn't it? You know, but anyways, sidetrack. Uh, he, uh, I was talking to him because he'd had some beautiful weather that week before. And so he said before he went out, instead of doing their normal warm-up that he wanted to do, uh, he, he said, I thought we'd switch it up and have some fun. So he had them play ultimate frisbee. And he divided up the teams, and one team was one person short. And so Vern said, I'm in. And Vern said, if I'm in... I'm in it to win it. Like, I'm going to play. And so they were playing. They were going back and forth. And it came down to where they needed one more goal or whatever you call it, one more point in order to win. And it said there was a Frisbee was thrown up in the air, and it was in the end zone. And it was him and one other middle school boy. And Vern said, I gave it everything to jump and grab that Frisbee. And he said, and I was in it to win it, but my calf muscle was not in it to win it. <laughs> he, said, he said he jumped and he tore his calf muscle. He tore his calf. Now, I've never torn a muscle. I've pulled a muscle before, but everybody who has torn a muscle tells me, man, it is, like, the pain is excruciating. Pulling a muscle hurts, but tearing it's even worse. And so I looked at Vern, and I was like, oh, dude, Vern, man, I'm so sorry. What, what did you do? And he looked right at me, and he said, my team won. That's what I did. <laughs> he, he said, I finished out the game, and my team won, and then we called 911. That's what he did. Now, here's how you can easily tell which of those two types of people you are. If you hear Vern's story and you go, that's absolutely ridiculous. Why would a man ever do something like that? You're probably a take it or leave it person. If you hear Vern's story and you're like, good for him. Way to go, Vern. You show those middle school boys. You're an in it to win it person. That's just, that's just how it is. Now, if I'm totally honest with you, I am definitely more of the latter. I am definitely more of an in-it-to-win-it person uh, than, than I am, and in some cases would like to admit. Now, thankfully, I have calmed down significantly over the years. I have way too many embarrassing stories, and my wife has way too many embarrassing stories where I took competition way too far, including a race to beat my own three-year-old daughter. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying, when she wins, she's going to earn it. That's all I'm saying, you know, but... I'm not going to tell you any more of those stories, but we could talk about them afterwards. But I wanted to tell you about that because I, I wanted to acknowledge that there are two types of people in the world when it comes to winning because I, I recognize that what we're talking about today is going to resonate more with some of you than others. 
right? But regardless of which type of person you would describe yourself is, with or which person you tend to identify with, I think that we can all agree that winning is important, right? Maybe I'm like, ah, I don't know, Curtis. Like, uh, it kind of depends on what it is. Okay, yeah, sure. Winning, but winning is important. And, and can we at least maybe agree on this, right? Maybe at least this basic premise. Winning is important because winning is better than not winning. Right, can I at least get an amen on that, right? Yeah. Right, like if, if you had a choice, if you had a choice, like, and, and you knew it didn't like poorly affect somebody else for those like that, that care about that in here, if you had a choice between winning and not winning, my guess is every single one of us would choose to win, right? We want to win, right? And so winning is better than not winning. And here's another way that we know about this. Let's talk about this for a second. Uh, I have been a fan of the Rocky movie since I was a little boy, like all 17,000 of the Rocky movies, right? Can I get, everybody, you know, give me a round of applause. Okay, fans of, um, and let's talk about, like, when I first, I first saw Rocky one over some of my friend's parents' house, her name was Joe and Alice Gibbs, and, and while they were, uh, while they were upstairs hanging out, I was watching Rocky one and uh, get to the end of the movie, and when Rocky is in the ring with Apollo Creed, and it comes down to a split decision, and they announce that Apollo Creed wins, I was like, ah! Oh! Like, it could have been such a better ending, and that's because winning is better than not winning. We all felt that way. When you get to the end of that movie, you're like, oh, he, he almost won. Like, he could have won. It would have been such, better, such a better film. Now, Creed II actually picks up the story where my favorite Rocky movie leaves off. Now, if I had to pick out my, one of my favorite original Rocky movies, the one that stand out and has always stood out the most to me is Rocky IV. Round of applause. Anybody like Rocky IV? Okay, so the story of Rocky IV uh, is this. It takes place in 1985, and Rocky Balboa fights the rising challenger Ivan Drago who's fighting from like the USSR. Now in the very beginning of the movie uh, Rocky's best friend and trainer Apollo Creed takes an exhibition match with Ivan Drago and Ivan Drago fights dirty. Right? He fights dirty, he fights after the bell and he ends up killing Apollo Creed in the ring. Spoiler alert, I know, but it was 1985. If you haven't watched it by now <laughs> You know, you might not be, be getting there. But so he actually kills Apollo Creed in the ring, right? And so Rocky ends up avenging Apollo's death by challenging Ivan and eventually defeating him. Now, the movie we're looking at today, Creed II, actually picks up the rest of that story, so to speak, because what happens, and we fast forward to 2018, and what's happened behind the scenes is when Ivan loses to Rocky in Rocky IV, Ivan loses everything. He loses credibility in the boxing world. The Soviet Union disowns him. His wife leaves him. And the only thing that Ivan is left with is his son. And so Ivan begins to raise his son Victor with the same sort of hate and intensity and to be a boxer and achieve what Ivan was not able to achieve. And where we pick up the story in, in, in Creed II, we meet a young man named Adonis Creed. Now, Adonis is actually Apollo's son, and Adonis with Rocky as his trainer, so Adonis with Rocky's trainer has actually risen in the boxing world and is now the heavyweight champion of the world. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Victor and Ivan show up in the United States talking all kinds of trash towards Adonis, and Victor challenges Adonis to a fight. And Adonis is thinking about taking this fight, and he ends up having this conversation with Rocky, which we see a little bit of in that trailer. And Rocky, as his good friend, right, as, he, as Adonis' trainer, can tell that Adonis' head's not in the right place. And in fact, it's like everybody in Adonis' world could tell, I mean, your head's not in the right place. They all want to know, why would you want to take this fight? I mean, Rocky asks him when he's in the alley. It's Adonis' mom says the same thing to him. His girlfriend slash fiance tells him the same thing. They can all tell, like, his head's not in the right place. And, and Rocky and Adonis have this conversation in the alley, and he wants to know, why? Why would you take this fight? You've already proven yourself. He actually says, what are you fighting for? And essentially what Rocky is asking here is, what's the win? What's the win, Adonis? Why would you do this? What are you fighting for? You've got everything that you could possibly want, 
Why take this fight? What's the win? And this question becomes a game-changing question in the movie. All right, and then the rest of it's him kind of like wrestling with this question. And it's a game-changing question in the movie, and I, I kind of thought about it. What about for us? Right, have you asked that question for yourself? What's your win? And if winning is important because winning is better than not winning, and if given the choice we would all rather win, especially in the most important arena, your life, what's your win? Have you ever really taken the time to ask yourself and answer that question? Right, maybe you're in a dating relationship right now. What's the win? Is the win marriage? Is the win kids? Is the win a happy marriage? What's the win? Financially, money, man, we think about money all of the time. We work so hard for it to try and save some, enjoy some, but what's the win? What's the win in terms of financially speaking? What's the win in our relationships, our friendships? Right, did you know that when you come to mind, words come to mind? Right, when someone brings you up in conversation, characteristics automatically begin to come up in the other person's mind. Wouldn't it be a win to decide what you want those words to be and then live in such a way as though they're already true? So that when you come to mind, things that you want, come, man, he's so, man, I love him, she's so, he's so good. Did, what's the win for you professionally? Right, did you know that professionally, if you don't take time to define the win, it can be like you running a race, and you're giving it everything you got, and you actually can cross the finish line and have no idea and just keep going because you never took time to define your win, and all the while, you're exhausted because you never took the time to define the win in the areas that matter most, most Never define the win. And we've got to take time to define our win, to figure out what your win is, to figure out what it is that you are fighting for. Because here's what happens. Here's what tends to happen to me. If I don't take time to figure out what it is I'm fighting for, if I don't take time to figure out what it is I'm aiming for, you know what tends to happen to me? You know what tends to happen to us? If we don't define the win, then what happens is, is we tend to adopt someone else's. If you don't adopt, if you don't define your own win, we tend to adopt someone else's. And so what happens is you end up dating the way everybody else dates. You end up parenting the way everybody else parents. Or you take your cues from those around you. Right? You work the way everybody else works. You treat your spouse the way everyone else treats their spouse. We take our cues from those around us and we settle we settle for what I feel like Adonis settles for when he takes the very first fight in Creed 2. You see, Rocky asks him, why? What's your win? What are you fighting for here? And Adonis never really answers the question, but he kind of dances around this idea of, I want to rewrite history. I don't want to be like my dad. He settles for what a preacher named Adam Johnson calls not goals. He settles for a not goal. Right? And if we don't take time to define our win, we'll tend to adopt someone else's or settle for a not goal. I don't want to be like my dad. That's not going to be our story. I'm just trying to do better than my parents did. I'm not. I won't. But what I want you to see, man, what becomes so evident like in the movie is that not goals are not enough because not goals are not wins. And so what I want to do this morning with the time that we have left is I want to show you a guy. I want to show you a guy in the Bible who determined and he defined his win. And then he set and organized his life around in such a way that he could achieve and made sure to achieve his win. All right, and so my, my point in showing you what his win is, is not for you to adopt his win. Now to be totally honest with you, if you are a follower of Jesus, I think you need to adopt his win. But the, the things we're talking about and the things that this guy Paul talks about in the Bible, this isn't just a Bible thing. This is a life thing. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the spiritual aspect of it. But my point in showing you his win is not that you adopt it, unless you're a follower of Jesus, but to give you insight into what we have to do if we want to win in the most important arenas in life. And here's the thing. You get to decide what are the most important arenas in your life. If you're married... You've already decided an arena. 
If you have kids, you've already decided on an arena, but professionally, you get to decide the arena. Right? Relationally, you get to decide. And so I'm going to show you what this guy named Paul says in a letter to the church in Corinth. He says this in 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 19. He says this. He says, though I am free, I belong to no one. I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why, Paul? To win as many as possible. Now, something you need to know about this guy named Paul is Paul's win that he defines in his life. Paul sets a win in his life, and it actually comes from a loss. All right, Paul had actually, before, he had previously arrested, beaten, and even killed followers of Jesus because he thought he was helping God that way. And then all of a sudden, Paul's out on one of these missions to go kill a bunch of Christians or to at least arrest and beat a bunch of Christians. And he's on his way to do that. And on the way, he meets the risen Jesus. And it's, uh-oh, like, I've not been doing this right. Jesus says, like, hey, man, you got you to get your act together. And so Paul actually makes some big changes. He actually reordered his life, and he changed his win. So that when asked, it was like, Paul, okay, Paul, what's your win? Paul's, Paul would say, my win is people. My win is people. I want to convince as many people as possible that Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, rose three days later so that we could be forgiven and have life in a good relationship with God. That's my win. Paul defines his win and he sets it as his north star. And then he goes on and he, so then he talks about this, about how he goes about achieving his win. He says in verse 20, he says this, he says, to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Now see, Paul actually was raised as a, as a young Jewish boy, and what he's saying here is, man, when I was around my Jewish family and my Jewish friends, man, I, I became the best Jewish person I could possibly be in hopes that I could win some influence to point them to Jesus. You see, what he's talking about here with the law, what he's saying is, is the Jews believe that there was like over 600 commands that they had to keep in order to be in good relationship with God. And so Paul's saying, man, when I was around my Jewish family and friends, man, I became the best tradition follower, the best rule follower that I could possibly be. Why? Even though, since I didn't have to, why would I do that since I don't have to? It's to win. I want to win them. I want to point them to Jesus. I hope that I can gain some influence so that through my life, they can find the best thing that I've ever found. And so Paul goes on. He says in verse 21, he says, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, those 600 commands. To the ones not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. We'll talk about that in a second. So as to win those not having the law. You see how everything filters back to that win for him? His win is people, pointing people to Jesus. And it says here, he says, though I'm not free from God's law, he's talking about those 600 commands, he said, I'm under Christ's law. Now, Jesus actually taught, Jesus actually was able to sum up all of those commands, where it's not over 600, it's not 10 commands. Jesus says, I give you one command. You go and you love people the way that I have loved you. That's what Jesus says at the end of his ministry. He sums up all of those commands in that one command. And so Paul says, that's what I'm under. Man, I'm under this, 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 this burden of I've got to love and care for people the way that Jesus loved and cared for me. And that's why I think Paul actually gives up violence as a way to win people to his cause. And like a side note, that's why I think we should give up shouting, yelling, berating, demeaning, and know-it-alling people in order to point them to Jesus. And so Paul goes on. In verse 22, he says, To the weak I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. Man, Paul's saying, I can get along with anybody. And the reason I can is because i got a North Star. I've got something that I'm aiming at. I want them to find the best thing that I've ever found, and that's Jesus. And so I become all things that I have to be to all people. Why? So that by all possible means, I might save some. By all possible means, meaning I've thought this through. I've, 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 I've organized my life. I've organized and ordered my life, my time, and my resources in such a way so that by all possible means, I might win by pointing people to Jesus. And so Paul defines his win, right? He sets out, there's no, there's no doubt what Paul's win is in his mind. He defines his win, he sets it, he writes it down, he points us to it, and then what he says next is for you and it's for me, 
It's for all of us who have some sort of win that we want to pursue. And it seems as though it's like he like switches subjects, but he actually dips into this sports metaphor in order, I think, to give us some sort of urgency to run after our win. He says this in verse 24. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? To which we're like, yeah, Paul, except if you're a millennial, right? Like, <laughs> like now I have my fair share... I've got my fair share of participation trophies. I'm a millennial. I can make that joke. But that's what it's like. It's like Paul, Paul, Paul points out, Paul says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, right? They're all running, but only one person gets the prize. I mean, in, in a competition, I mean, it's so easy to see what's going on because you're all lined up together. Like in a race, you're side by side. You know how you're doing in comparison to the person next to you. On the football field, you can always look at the scoreboard. You know how you're doing. On the baseball field, on the basketball court, in cheerleading, in dance, someone goes before you, you go, and then someone goes after you. You always know how you're doing. But when it comes to your life, it's not that easy, is it? Right? In your marriage, your profession, your parenting, your friendships, sometimes it's difficult to tell. It's just not as obvious. And so when it's not as obvious, I think what happens is, consequently, we lack urgency. And so that's why I think Paul gives us this metaphor here. And he goes on and he finishes verse 24, the rest of 24. says this, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as you get the prize. Get it. Right? Live your life with the same urgency the same energy, the same focus, and the same drive that it would take for you to win the competition, right? Live in such a way as that you win. I think what Paul's saying here is pay the price you have to pay in order to win the prize. Pay the price you have to pay in order to win the prize. So you want to win in your marriage? I mean, that means you, gotta, you might have to cut some things. Maybe you need to cut social media, so that you and your spouse can spend some more face-to-face -face time together, right? Just get rid of the distractions so you can focus on communicating together. Maybe you need to make counseling a priority for the two of you with your time as well as your budget. You want to win with your finances? Maybe you, you need to start with making a budget, I think, that includes generosity, right? So you've got to make some cuts. You've got to get rid of some distractions, right? You've got to pay the price because in a, an athletic competition, there's always a price you have to pay. We know that when it comes to sports, but for some reason, we don't treat life like, li like that. So Paul says, run in such a way as you get the prize. He goes on in verse 25, he says this, he says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, and they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. He says they go into strict training. Why? Because they, they have something they want to win. So he actually references here the very first, like, what will become, like, the Olympic Games. And when you would win your event in the Olympic Games, they would actually give you a crown of laurel leaves. That's where the phrase resting on your laurels comes from. You know, like the idea of using your past accomplishments to rest now. And Paul says, man, they'll go into strict training to win a crown of leaves. And then he talks to Jesus followers, right? He talks to those of us who like are following Jesus. Like, man, we compete for a crown that will last forever. So they'll do all this stuff. They'll spend all this time, money, and energy, and effort on a crown of leaves that might last two, three, maybe a week, and then it dries and withers away. But we do it for a crown that will last forever. And so Paul, like, brings us back into, like, thinking about, like, what your win is. Because, like, the reality is I don't want to get to the end of my life and wonder if I won. I don't want to get to the end of my life and wonder, how did I do? And so Paul goes on. He says in 26 and 27, he says, Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may, will not be disqualified for the prize. In Creed 2, the very first fight that Adonis takes, Victor, the, the Russian, ends up getting disqualified because he fights dirty. Right? If, if Ivan, his dad, fought dirty, Victor fights even dirtier. 
And while he's fighting dirty, Victor actually badly injures Adonis. And Rocky comes to talk to Adonis, and he gives what I think is one of the best quotes in the movie. And I was going to do my best to give it to you, like Sylvester Stallone version. Uh, but I thought I'd spare you that and just show you the clip. So check this out real quick. You, know, you might get the Sylvester Stallone version anyway. No, I got other plans. You want to make some, you want to change things in a big way? Then you need to make some big changes. Da, da, da. And that's it. That's it. So, work first service. Hey, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, that was, that was improv. I guess we'll have to, I have to work on my Sylvester Stallone impression. But I, mean, but, I mean, it's a simple quote. It's a simple quote, but here's the deal. We know it, and yet we won't apply it. It says, you want to make, you want to make, you want to change things in a big way? Then you need to make some big changes. And it actually goes on in the movie, and Rocky actually tells Adonis, he's like, here's the deal, your natural fighting style is not going to work when you're fighting a guy that big. And so I think the coolest scene in the movie is where they're out training in the desert, and they ha he, Rocky teams him up against a, like a sparring partner, this big, huge guy, and they have to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with their feet inside this tire in the ring. And he totally changes the way Adonis trains. And really what Rocky's saying here is the same thing that Paul in his godly wisdom is trying to point us to. And Paul said, man, I made some big changes. I realized I wasn't running after the wind that I wanted to run at in my life, and so I made some big changes, and I do not run like someone running aimlessly anymore. Man, it is so easy in our culture to do relationships, to spend money, to parent, to work, to do anything that we have to do in our culture aimlessly. I mean, it's so easy, man, it's so easy to parent aimlessly. It's so easy to do relationships aimlessly. Like, that's easy. But that doesn't help you win. And if you do not have a win, man, it's so, it's so extremely easy for us to spend a season or seasons of our life running aimlessly. And Paul says, I'm not doing that anymore. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave. Why, Paul? Because I know what I'm about. I know what I'm aiming for. I've defined my win for my life, and I'm going to make sure at the end of the day that I've gotten to where I want to be, even though it means I'm going to have to say no to myself for now. I mean, isn't that what you want? Isn't that what, isn't that what it, you want? I know it is. Because look at some of the things that you've already achieved in your life, and you've done that by defining the win and then organizing and ordering your life around that. Paul's saying the same thing to us, something that we already know, and that's that you do not win by wishing. Right? You don't win by wishing. You don't win by talking. You don't win by hoping. You win by preparing to win. So what's your win? What's your win relationally? What's your win financially, academically, professionally? What is it that you want people to say about you one of these days? When words come to mind, what do you want those words to be? Are you preparing to win? Singles. If your win is a happy, great marriage, then you cannot date the way most people date. If you want a marriage that is not like most marriages, then you cannot date like most daters. And a challenge that I'm getting pushback from in a couple of, but I would really challenge you, man, take a year off. Take a year off from dating. Go now, set a year later in the calendar, then that's so that you can clarify yourself. You can clarify the win, and that way when you step back into the game, you can be clear and focused so that you don't date aimlessly. You have a purpose and a goal in mind. You know, are you prepared to say no now to things that will distract you from your win? And you will find it much easier to tell yourself no once you've defined the win. But until you discover or decide and set what your win is, you will find no compelling reason to tell yourself no. And at the risk of being a little bit dramatic as we kind of close out this morning, you might leave here and think, my curse was a little over dramatic at that point, and, uh, and, and, and maybe so. Um, but uh, I, I, think, I think we all know it's true, and calling it over dramatic really is just trying to shift the responsibility and make it sit a little bit easier. But the truth is, you only get one season. Right? You only get to do high school one time. 
you only get to be in your 20s one time. You don't get to come back next spring and do your 20s again. That'd be nice, though, wouldn't it? You only get to be in your 30s one time. You only get one first marriage. You only get to raise each of those kids one time. The clock is ticking. Have you defined your win? And remember this. When you win, the people closest to you, the people on your team, win as well. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I hope this stuff, I hope what we talked about with Paul in here, I hope what we talked about uh, has been helpful. I hope it's inspiring. I hope some of you will go out here, you'll set some wins, and you will achieve them. This isn't just a Christian thing. This is a life thing. But I want you to hear, you need to hear, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want you to know, I think Jesus is the key to the most important win in your life. As I live out Jesus' teachings in my life, I'm becoming a better husband, a better father, a better man. He is coming through in every arena of life. And if Jesus is correct, and I believe that he is, our lives are not bookended with a birth certificate and a death certificate. There is more to it than that. And without him, you are missing the most important win. And if you're willing to live out his wisdom in every important arena of your life, why not trust him with the spiritual arena as well? What I want you to do is I want you to mark off there on your Connect card, I want, you, uh, I want to know more about following Jesus. So someone can follow up with you and we can help you win in that arena of life. Now here's the deal though, if you do call Momentum your church home, if you do call yourself a follower of Jesus, a Christian like me, then what we want to do is we want to live out what Jesus is taught, what Jesus teaches, right? We're not going to be perfect at it, but we're doing our best. And this stuff that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 9, it's not meant to just be inspiring, right? It's not optional for us. One of our wins is telling people about Jesus and the way that he has made changes in our lives. And, and so as, as I started studying this, man, and I watched Creed 2, and I'm getting all like pumped up and like, man, I wish I was a boxer, you know. Uh, I started going through it and uh, I, I started to kind of go through and felt challenged to define some of my own wins. And as we're going through, I came across Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the exercises he has you do in there is imagine your funeral and four different people from four different arenas of your life come and speak at your funeral. And he says, take some time to, to figure out what it is you'd like them to say. That's Stephen Covey's way of kind of defining, helping you define your wins. And... Uh, kind of close out this morning to maybe help give you some inspiration I want to share with you some of my personal wins that I'm working on and my wife and I we're kind of working on together and I started thinking about as what is something I want people to say about me when I die I, I hope the first thing that each of those four people would say has something to do about Jesus I, I recognize, like, they're all, they're all, they all I, at least I hope, they're all going to say something about Jesus. I mean, I'm a minister, you know, like, <laughs> really would miss the mark if that doesn't make it in there anywhere. So I realize they're probably going to say something about Jesus. But then I, I felt convicted, is the first thing they say going to have anything to do with Jesus? I want it to be. And that made me realize, I got to talk about Jesus some more. Now, not on Sunday mornings, I mean, we do that every single Sunday, but the, the guys I hang out at the gym with, right, the guys that I go and I eat lunch with, the guys that I, I play old man softball with, <laughs> Jesus has got to start coming up in more of those conversations if I want to achieve that win. But you see how all of a sudden I got a filter to start running some things through? The second win that I've come up with is I hope that they say shortly after the Jesus thing, I hope they can unequivocally say that I loved and honored Abby, my wife, completely. The way the Bible would describe it is that I loved her as Jesus loved the church. And then our third win, and my wife and I, we're still working on the wording of this. But our third win is that we want to raise kids who love Jesus and love to be around each other. We want them to have a camaraderie among their siblings where they always want to be around each other. You see, and I know that those are lofty wins, right? 
but, but I'm learning my wins, and now I'm trying to order my life around that. And here's the deal. I know I need help, and that momentum, that's what we're all about. That's what you guys, that's what momentum helps me do. If you don't call momentum your, your church home, man, that's what we want to do. We want to help you find those wins and then help you order those life and challenge you and encourage you to go and achieve those wins. We want to point you to Jesus when you need wisdom. Man, that's what I need my Mo group for. Our Mo groups have kicked back up six to 12 people and meet in someone's home where we talk about this kind of stuff and then become a family where we can encourage each other to go and pursue our wins. I want to say the same thing to you that Paul is saying to us. That's don't run like someone running aimlessly anymore. Don't just box just beating the air. A boxer just beating the air. Decide what your win is and order your life in such a way to get the win. Like, I want to win, but I know that I'm going to need help to do so. And that's where Jesus, his teachings, momentum, that's where we all come in training together. And Paul says here, let your life, your money, your parenting, your dating, your work, live in such a way. He echoes Jesus' own words when he says, let your light shine in such a way that people catch a glimpse of your Father in heaven. Because at the end of the day, that's a win. But in the meantime... What's your win? What's your win? Because after all, winning is better than not winning.